heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Live from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York, I'm Caroline Hyde. And I'm Ed Ludlow, as if by magic also in the Big Apple. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Ed, Intel, it plunges after disappointing investors with its forecast. We're going to be sitting down with the Intel CEO, Pat Gelsinger, to break down the company's results. Alphabet, Amazon and Microsoft facing FTC probes about their investments and partnerships with AI companies. Details ahead. And Salesforce, look, it's adding to a brutal string of tech layoffs in 2024, announcing it's slashing 700 workers. We'll discuss that and so much more throughout the hour. But first, let's check in on these markets. And we're treading water, let's put it. We've had some mixed bag in terms of overall macro picture. Inflationary pressure dialing back. Retail still going strong when it comes to the consumer. Which way will the Federal Reserve go? The market tries to assess that. We're just up about a tenth of percent on the Nasdaq. But remember, we had some good, strong gains yesterday. In fact, record highs for the S&P 500, six straight days of gains. Two-year yield, though, is really where some of these question marks are showing up more. Yields push higher on the front end. That means people are pricing in perhaps a slower pace of rate cuts coming from the Federal Reserve. I look at what's happening in China. Once again, geopolitics at play here. Once again, some concerns about med tech companies in China, particularly coming from the United States. That sent shockwaves into the Chinese trade. We're seeing we're off just about four tenths percent for some of the key internet names and tech names traded here in the US. Move on to have a look at what's happening in the great world of Bitcoin because we are just heading a little bit higher. $41,000. We're just hearing from James Seaford, who's going to be joining us a little bit later. But off eight tenths of percent in the last 20, well, the last week or so trade, but more broadly, we are managing to just um, up a little bit, Ed. Maybe that's all about, well, the outflows just easing a little bit for GBTC, but more on that later. What have you got on the micro? Well, look, there's just a single point of focus in tech right now, which is Intel. The stock in this session down more than 10%. Intraday, biggest drop in around a year. If it closes down beyond 10%, it will be the biggest drop since the end of 2021. What is going on? Well, the outlook has us worried, particularly about how Intel is faring in the market for chips that go into data centers. But remember, they're also growing this fledgling foundry business. And there was just a lack of detail. We don't know who the customers are, but there also doesn't seem to be enough dollars committed to that foundry and fab business. We're going to be speaking later in the hour with Pat Gelsinger, the CEO of Intel. If you're watching on Bloomberg Television, you're on the terminal, IB us. Contact us on social media with your questions because there are lots of questions to ask on where are we at in this turnaround plan that Pat Gelsinger has kind of put in front of investors for a number of quarters right now, Cara. And Ed, a lot of what he's been hoping for is, well, the winds of positivity coming from AI investment. But let's just talk about AI in a different way right now from the regulatory perspective, because the FTC has launched an inquiry into Alphabet, Amazon, Microsoft on their investments and partnerships with companies like Anthropic, like OpenAI, those private companies. This is part of a study on how artificial intelligence is impacting competition in the tech industry. I'm pleased to say Bloomberg's Jackie Davalos, our AI expert and also Washington expert, joins us now. And Jackie, the FTC here is really trying to garner as to whether or not these are kind of M&A deals by a back door. Well, when you look at it, they're not small deals. They might be creative and that it's not a traditional mergers and acquisitions deal, but the FTC is well aware of that. And the reason they are on their radar is because it's a massive amount of money. It's $19 billion collectively between the $13 billion Microsoft committed to OpenAI, the $2 billion that Anthropic raked in from Alphabet, and then the almost $4 billion it got from Amazon. On. These are enormous stakes, and the FTC wants to understand, should they be subject to the same types of merger rules? Now, they're not the only regulators that got uh, that have these companies on their radar. The UK started their own inquiry in, De in December, and then you had the European Union also starting to take a look at whether they should be kind of looked at like a merger would um, earlier this month. You know, Jackie, the FTC has the who's who of mega cap tech in their sites and the leaders in, in building of LLMs. But I want to go to Microsoft specifically because of being the world's most valuable company as it stands. But also the Microsoft open AI thing is somewhere something we've done a lot of reporting on. What is Microsoft's response been to the news of the last 24 hours? 
they defended the partnership and actually said that the U.S. has been ahead in AI because of these partnerships. Their top competitions lawyer also said that they look forward to providing the information the FTC needs to really assess the nature of this relationship. But you're absolutely right, Ed. Microsoft here is arguably more at risk than perhaps some of these other companies. Microsoft has overhauled its entire product line to integrate OpenAI's AI technology and large language model into the most ubiquitous tools and its most profitable tools it has. And so, of course, whether the FTC decides that there's nothing to see here, that these partnerships are valid, that's one outcome. But then the other one could mean untangling these partnerships in some way. And this is where Microsoft is arguably more expensive. Hey, Bloomberg's Jackie Davalos out in D.C. with the reporting. Thank you. Let's continue the conversation with Christina Kafara, co-founder and vice chair of the Competition Research Policy Network at the Center for Economic Policy Research in London. She's a specialist in antitrust and has advised on high-profile landmark competition cases on behalf of the tech companies, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon and many others. We've been through the detail, but the timing for me is really interesting. There has been a large body of reporting, most of it from Bloomberg, about regulators around the world looking at the relationship between mega cap tech and the new players in AI. Why do you think the FTC has acted now? It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, the reason this announcement by the FTC is significant is uh, that it is the first of the regulators who is actually doing a wide-ranging type of investigation over these partnerships. As uh, your reporter mentioned, the UK uh, CMA, the UK regulator, the European Commission are already looking into this specific partnership between OpenAI and Microsoft, but there is uh, a broader focus in the FTC's announcement. And what's behind it, and it is really common to all of these regulators, I, I certainly would describe them as a triad of fairly progressive regulators, the European Commission, the UK regulator, and the, U the US agencies. What's common uh, between them is an anxiety that essentially we do not want to see the same playbook unfold again. What has happened in the past is that regulators have been very slow in intervening. For the first decade and the second decade, really there's been a reluctance to intervene in these sectors because there was a sense that antitrust is really a problem that affects low innovation sectors, an analog rather than digital, and, and things will take care of themselves. Yeah. So antitrust intervention has been late, and, 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 and this is really what is uh, powering the anxiety that regulators have. We cannot let this playbook unfold yet again. We need to be vigilant. We need to be seen to be doing something. Christina, what again, about the anxiety? Is it a reality, that anxiety, that basically these partnerships are more than partnerships? They are indeed M&A. They absolutely. are indeed control. Oh, absolutely. The anxiety extends to this because the concern internal to the agencies is that boardrooms have internalized that the climate of enforcement has become uh, more hostile to deals. I mean, if you think about Microsoft Activision, it took two years and it isn't over yet. So there is a general awareness that doing deals is much more difficult now. And there is an anxiety that companies are effectively de facto circumventing merger control by dressing up these relationships as partnerships. So this is certainly the second leg of the anxiety. We've been too late, we've not done enough, and now we are exposed to the risk that these companies are actually doing deals by the back door. So that's really right. why you know, Christina, this is significant. Caroline and I have covered so many of these FTC inquiries on this program, Bloomberg Technology, all of them slightly different. But the question they all share in common is, to whose benefit is the FTC acting? You know, people are worried about AI, but there's also a broad body of people that say this could really help humankind. It's very expensive to achieve. And those names that are the subject of this inquiry are those with the capital to drive the progress. Does the FTC put any weight on that latter argument? Of course. And I think Lena Khan in her announcement yesterday emphasized at the beginning that these points are well taken. I think 
humanity to the extent possible wants to benefit from this. And of course, we're all aware that there are massive investments that need to be put into this, which is why these players are at the forefront of development. That said, we have a recent history, which is a history of failure of engaging with these questions. And while one doesn't want to prejudge the outcome, one needs to be vigilant because we have spent the last 10 years, certainly in Europe where I reside, trying to pursue ex post investigations of conduct. You are at that point in the US too, you have a number of complaints. How many years will it take before anything will move, before yeah. everything comes even to, to a court? Uh, the, the Google well, Christina, to that come... point, when you look at what's happening yes. in Europe, they're actually taking regulatory action that forces Absolutely. a change. Will we see actually companies front run this? In, in Europe, what you've seen is because antitrust has failed spectacularly to deliver so far, we've been at it for 15 years. There hasn't been a moving of the dial. There hasn't been a single antitrust decision on Google, on others that has actually changed the situation on the ground. So we pivoted to regulation. Now, it remains to be seen whether this regulation, which is now being implemented, is going to move the dial itself. These are all experiments, frankly. The sense is, therefore, that if you kind of try and correct the issue, when the monopolies are established, where market power is established, when power is entrenched, you struggle. You are not going to be able to effectively undo yeah. that power. And so the notion of looking at it early and looking at what the nature of this partnership, for example, is. So what are the potential issues here? I mean, think about this industry as a, as a supply chain that's yes. verticalized. Never mind that there is at the bottom a lot of competition. Yes. The issue is the power at the level of the inputs, the power at the level of the models. Now, if that power is very concentrated, then the question that regulators need to ask is, how will that input, which is essential to all of these products, the general models, be effectively supplied? Will it be supplied on conditions that are disadvantageous, that are extractive, that are exploitative, yes. that effectively remove the ability of others to compete? The fact that this, at, the, at the product level, there's thousands of, of people implementing AI applications is jolly good. But if there's only one or two or three suppliers of this, then the question becomes, will they preference themselves? Will they have advance notice of the, what, of, of the next development? Will, will they... And to conclude, will they uh, effectively favor the development of technology in ways that suit them? Some food for thought for sure. Christina Kafara, we thank you for the time and the expertise. Thank Center you. of Economic Policy Research over in London. Happy weekend. Meanwhile, sticking on the theme of AI, OpenAI CEO Sam Altman, when he's actually visiting leaders in South Korea's semiconductor industry this week, this is as he's weighing, of course, a pretty ambitious move into chip production. Altman has arrived in Seoul last night and he's touring Samsung's chip fabrication plants today, according to a source. He's also scheduled to meet the CEO of rival SK Hynix to discuss ways to collaborate. Ed, some of your reporting there. Yeah, big time. Coming up on the program, the job cuts keep coming in tech, this time at Salesforce, which is laying off about 700 workers. We'll talk more about it next and the broader impact on tech's labor force. This is Bloomberg Technology. So in another effort to cut costs, Salesforce is now the latest big tech company resorting to layoffs. Bloomberg's Brody Ford has details. And Brody, Salesforce has already cut a number of staff. This time it's small in percentage form, but 700 is nothing to be sniffed at. Right. Yeah, it's tempting to say that, hey, a year ago there was, you know, 7,000 people cut. Now it's 700, so we don't care so much, but it's still... What it shows to us is that the tech industry is still focused on cutting costs, and this may become a more regular part of the year, right? Um, it's like we're going back to 1950 and GE and stack ranking, right? We saw this with Microsoft, Amazon, Google. Companies that made big cuts last year are doing well financially, still see it in their interest to trim a couple percentage points periodically. So I expect this to be a trend to continue. The point of difference from this time last year is, is, yes, the size of the cuts. But if you go on any website of those that have cut Salesforce, Microsoft, whatever, they're also hiring. Mm -hmm. And where they're hiring is clear as day, Brody. 
Yeah, where there, I mean, it's two letters we've been hearing every day for the last year and a half, AI, right? Um, Salesforce has told me that they're really hiring for engineering roles and for those who are go to market for their AI products. Um, I think a lot of companies, Salesforce more than most, really focused on pairing back these traditional sales and marketing roles. Yep. Um, so now they're kind of investing in what's going to bring them further. And, you know, unfortunately for some workers, it is probably cheaper to fire than hire externally than it is maybe to retrain some of your people. Goodbye, marketing. Hello, computer nerds. Bloomberg's Brody yep. Ford. Thank you very much. Now, coming Thank up here you. on Bloomberg Technology, we go back to earnings coverage and we sit down with Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger amid the company's results that offered investors a disappointing forecast and the stock is down significantly as a result. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome to our Bloomberg television and radio audiences worldwide. The Focus, Intel and the chipmakers earnings, a forecast for the current period that makes the market nervous about Pat Gelsinger's turnaround plan for Intel, some worry about its data center business and a, a fledgling foundry business. I'm delighted to say we are joined by Pat Gelsinger, Intel's CEO. Pat, the, the stock is down more than 10%. What is it that the market is not understanding here for Intel? Well, thanks, Ed, and always a pleasure to be with you and Carolyn on the show. You know, first, we finished a great year. We had Q4, uh, beat on top and bottom line, finishing a year that was comfortably ahead, you know, and showing the transformation uh, journey that we're on. And we believe we're putting points on the board for a long-term transformation of this iconic uh, company. In light of that, hey, the Q1, you know, at the low end of seasonal. So we think the market reaction is a bit overstated in that respect. We understand it, but our company, our employees are doing an incredible job at delivering our process technology, restoring product uh, leadership, defining new categories like the AI PC. We're on a multi-year journey and we're not gonna be judged on a 90-day shot clock. We are out to rebuild this company and we had a great 23 and I'm confident in a great 24 for this company. Pat, there were, there were so many questions on the call about your foundry business. And for our global audience, that's the co sort of contract manufacturing business where you make chips for others. And, and, and I'm, you seem to say that you didn't get an, as many committed dollars as you thought you might. And I wonder what's standing in the way of that. Customers committing oh. to backing your foundry business. Yeah, and we're very comfortable with the progress. You know, we said that we'd have one on our leading edge node, 18A, as it's called, and we delivered four for the year. We also found that there was a lot of momentum in our uh, packaging uh, business where we now have five major customers on our advanced packaging uh, technology. And we said, hey, you know, we went from 4 billion to over 10 billion of lifetime deal value. So good momentum, but most importantly, is the process technology itself. Are we back to a leadership technology? And we're hitting all the milestones, this audacious five nodes and four year plan. And all of the milestones are on track to have us back to process leadership in 25. And as I say, a foundry company, they wanna know that if they design on us, they can build the best products and we're gaining momentum in uh, delivering on exactly that promise. And so proud of my teams for delivering on such an audacious plan, we're on track. What about track for AI accelerators? Not just AI on the PC, but I, I put it bluntly, Pat, NVIDIA's run away with this. When or can you regain any sort of leadership in that space? Yeah, and clearly that's been an area of strength for them. We appreciate that they've, as I say, focused on that for many years and uh, the market has come their way in a strong way. 
But our roadmap is gaining momentum. Gaudi, too, we said we're seeing a significant expansion in the customer pipeline uh, that we have. We're ramping up supply. So I'll say we're chasing to have enough supply you know, to meet market. And we're well underway on our next generation, Gaudi 3, uh, as it's called, with 4x the compute, 2x the network in the lab, gaining uh, you know, really, really good uh, early debug in uh, bringing that product to market later this year. So we feel like, hey, you know, yes, you know, we have a lot of work to do here, but the momentum is building, the market is looking for alternatives, and our roadmap is strengthening as we go through the year. But more importantly, Carolyn, is this idea that last year was the year of high-end training. Mm -hmm. This year, it's about how do I use those models? And that's much more about the enterprise strength where Intel is at the edge, in the PC, and in the enterprise data center. So we see the market coming our way in AI in 24 and 25. And let's go to that core segment. Let's go to data centers because you have promised that you are not losing market share there. How do you show that evidence of that, Pat? In Q4, our estimates are we are about flat in uh, market share in Q4. So clearly we lost share, weakness of products, but that's now being overcome. We are executing on our product roadmap and we're ahead of schedule on the products for 24. We're seeing great momentum for the 2024 product line, good execution. And I'm very happy to say we sent our first 2025 product on 18A already into fab ahead of schedule. So our execution momentum is building. We see that we've stabilized our market share and now it's time for us to rebuild where we were before and we have the products and the strength to go do it. Really proud of our team's progress here. For our Bloomberg television and radio audience worldwide, we're speaking with the Intel CEO, Pat Gelsinger. And, and Pat, when I've been down to Santa Clara and, and sort of seen the reality of Intel, it it's always strikes me as being more multifaceted than, say, NVIDIA, right, on its, its high-end performance GPU. A part of that is the packaging. A part of that is your differentiation with Foundry. But I go back to Caroline's point on the, on the core business. What seems to be happening in the context of data center is CPU. And I just wondered if you'd explain to our audience what you think is happening in that market, specifically on the CPU side. Yeah, and then the CPU uh, last year was clearly a year there was more energy on the GPU, right, for these high-end training systems. But as we come into this year, we think there's going to be more balance between the CPU and the accelerator marketplace. Clearly, we're going to be participating more in the accelerator, but the strength of Intel has been our Xeon, the core data center CPU. And you know, coming out of uh, World Economic Forum and Davos and CES, I probably met with 50 customers and the enthusiasm that they have and the traditional strength that Intel has in the enterprise. And you know, we're in year 20 of the cloud, uh, Ed, and 60% yes. of computing is in the cloud, but 80% of the data remains on-prem in the enterprise data center. That's where Intel is uniquely strong, and our CPUs and accelerators are gonna unlock that capability for our customers. This is an exciting time for us to really enable them to use those models, and that's a strength for Intel and our CPUs. Pat, when I look at the cloud and the hyperscalers themselves, the, the really interesting story is their in-house design work and their in-house silicon progress. Do you consider that a factor in how your own business in, in the data center and cloud side performed and how you think it will perform going forward? Yeah, and one of the things that I said, Ed, is Intel has the opportunity of 100% of the AI market for it. Because we're gonna have our product offerings, Xeon is strong, showing up with a greater improvement in our accelerator product line. But we're also gonna be a foundry. And all of those internal programs that you see at Amazon and at Google and at Microsoft, hey, I wanna be the foundry for those. And all of the competitors' products, I wanna be the foundry for them, as well as we're seeing the momentum of our packaging technology. So. When you think about it that way, Intel uniquely is the company that has the opportunity to participate in 100% of the AI market with our products and our foundry, and that's exactly what we're intent upon doing. Has any of the weakness in demand thus far been because of this in-house design and build commitment from some of these companies, or have you already managed to sort of seal verbal approval that you'll be doing these for them from a foundry business? 
You know, uh, at this point, I'd say it's pretty early. I don't think it's really affected the market that much, uh, Carolyn, so far. But I do think this forward-looking view is a unique one for Intel, that we do get to participate in both sides of that uh, market. There's a lot of energy here, as uh, the cloud vendors are saying, how do I have a more cost-effective solution for these large training and inferencing demands of generative AI? And for that, every one of them has these projects underway and we're engaging with all of them as we speak. So I really see that as a long-term opportunity. It takes multiple years for those to materialize, but our technologies, as they gain momentum, are showing up at just the right time to satisfy a unique AI market for those cloud vendors. And we've just been hearing how, you know, within this change that we see around AI, so comes a change in talent in many of these companies. Are you in any way having to reorientate your own workers, your own colleagues, Pat? Are you having to let go of people? Well, every day it's focused on talent. And in the technology industry, Carolyn, you know, talent, right, as uh, once one of our CFOs used to say, he said, we start with sand, right, the second most plentiful material on earth, and everything else is talent between then and delivering our products and technology. So this idea of talent is so critical to our markets. Now, Intel has a well-tenured and very capable uh, base in both software and in hardware, but we're reorienting them very fast to the AI requirements, to data skills, to software skills, but we build on a very firm foundation and we're making good moves to bring additional talent uh, into the company as well to continue to have the best people to do the best products to enable the best customer experience that they could possibly have. And a great example of that is the AIPC where we're unquestionably defining the category, have a strong roadmap and delivering on it at scale with ISVs and our uh, OEMs in the marketplace today. Pat, before we let you go, you, you mentioned 18A. You in the past have been kind and explained to me what it takes to jump generation to generation on the manufacturing side and, and kind of the process to retain and regain uh, technology leadership. So in the, the time, small time we have left, what evidence do you have that that beautiful chart you drew for me on the whiteboard is playing out? the way that you expected to? Well, we delivered the design collateral. It's called a PDK in Q4 of last year. We've seen our customers expand uh, against that. And most importantly, we sent our first major product into the fab just before uh, earnings call started ahead of schedule. And if you could take a big processor design like a server chip and send it with stable design rules into manufacturing, you know, that's a pretty definitive statement of momentum. And we're adding customers and uh, we have 75 test chips in the plan uh, right now. So lots of customers are saying, hmm, let me try my design. And importantly, we have our Foundry Day, you know, this opening of the doors of Intel Foundry coming up in February. So a moment for the ecosystem, the EDA partners, the IP providers, and our customers to show up and see the progress that we're making. And for the first time, we'll talk about what comes after 18A. You know, we're not finished. You know, the Moore's Law, we are the stewards. Until the periodic table is exhausted, we ain't finished. And we're confident we're the company that's going to keep innovating and process technology for decades to come. Moore's Law, indeed. Intel CEO, Pat Gelsinger, thank you. Caroline. Let's have a quick check on these markets because, well, we know that Intel perhaps is a bit of a pull on the overall NASDAQ and the NASDAQ 100. Just focusing on that benchmark, we are off by about a tenth of a percent. We're trending water after some mixed economic data today. Look, the inflationary pressures seem to dial back that favoured number by the Federal Reserve, just showing a slowing coolest in about three years. But we are still seeing some strength on the consumer and the overall retail side of things. So at the moment, we're seeing a bond market that still anticipates perhaps less rate cuts than the market had been pricing in. We're up five basis points on the front end of the curve. I'm looking at what's happening in China. Trading flat, interestingly, on the crane shares, the internet players on basically managing to tread water despite what was some concerns, angst, again, geopolitically speaking, about med tech companies and a pushback from the US versus those Chinese players. Moving on and have a look at the individual movers that are in play today. As we say, Intel off by more than 10%. We have been having some key concerns there. Right. We'll move on from this particular full screen in a moment. But Intel has been off by some 10%. KLA has also been off by more than 5%. This, of course, 
being another semiconductor equipment maker, and they too seen some earnings that didn't live up to expectations, right. some softness there. On the higher side, though, has been at T-Mobile, Ed. So they managed to add more than 900,000 subscribers. So one of the key yeah, sort of Yeah, it's a huge move lower in Intel, and it, understandably, some of that nervousness goes over to the rest of the chip sector. You and I have also been talking about that it's an election year, and first and foremost in the coming week, you have all of the social media CEOs mm -hmm. in one place. Meta, for example, is adding further measures to protect teens from unwanted contact by turning off their ability to receive direct messages from anyone they don't follow or aren't connected to on Instagram by default. They're also increasing parental controls. These measures come ahead of a Senate hearing on online child sexual exploitation where the CEOs of Meta, X, TikTok, Snap and Discord will testify next week. Uh, there is a lot to pass over. Let's break it down with Sharon Franco, head of legal and public policy at Yubo, a Paris-based social discovery platform for Gen Z, which has just unveiled its own reference document on universal safety principles for young people online. Welcome to the program. We're very familiar with getting all of the CEOs of social media companies in one place and lobbing questions at them. The cynicism or skepticism is, what does it achieve? Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, I cannot speak uh, for the platform, but uh, I'm, not, I'm the head of the year at Hugo, so Meta is not, uh, I cannot speak instead of Meta, etc. but I expect that... We're just having some struggles hearing you at the moment. Let us just uh, focus in on your microphone for a second, because right. I think that we are going to be hearing from the Yubo perspective, is, of course, this is a company that's building in collaboration with Meta and some of these other companies, social media companies, a way in which you can sort of self-police, a way in which they can put in guardrails and in yes. many ways use artificial intelligence as a means of not just a worry when it comes to exposure for children, but more of a, a tool to heal and a way in which that companies can identify when there's bad behavior going on, when there's child exploitation potentially happening across their platform. Remember that this hearing next week was due to happen before the holidays. And mm. my understanding from sources is they couldn't get their act together and the CEOs couldn't be in one place at one time. But you raise really good points. I brought up the election cycle. You bring up AI, and the thing that you and I hear all the time in the cybersecurity context is all of the great tools that we have to advance our work and things at home, the threat actors have to amplify malicious content. So it's going to be interesting if that's the point of focus that the, the lawmakers go after, because often when you get all these CEOs in one place, yeah. they don't focus really on it's one It's about sound, sound bites, isn't it, uh, unfortunately? Point of conversation. Uh, Sharon, I, I believe your, your microphone's back up and running. So let's go with that. You know, what is it that you think the industry, the social media industry, needs to demonstrate to the public in the coming week? They need to demonstrate, and I think it's already uh, something that is already uh, a work in progress. They need to demonstrate that they are invested and committed into uh, tackling these uh, issues and protecting uh, children online. Um, but I think that now we need to focus on solution, and uh, I expect from this hearing, for example, that it will be focused on solutions, operational solutions, practical solutions. I think that the purpose that uh, the, the, the Senate is, uh, is looking for with this hearing, not only having a, uh, an overview of the issues, because we know the issues, we know the impact uh, of the use of social media and the risk that the children are facing on using the, these yeah. platforms, but now we need to focus on operational solutions and that's the work that we've been doing at Hubo also, uh, really since the beginning of the company, working on finding solution, practical solutions. Let's uh, talk about them then. In many ways, you are trying to ensure that someone is the age they identify themselves as. In particular, whether that's using photos and artificial intelligence to identify whether they are indeed older or younger than the age they've put in. Anyone under 13 shouldn't be using the app. How have you done that from a privacy perspective? How have you done that from an opt-in perspective? You're pointing out one of the biggest issues when you talk about uh, putting uh, in place operational solution to, uh, in terms of safety, it's the privacy uh, obligation. So as you know, uh, Yubo is a French company, so we are European, so yeah. privacy uh, and with the GDPR is something that comes natural for us. Uh, and that's why since uh, the creation of the company, we've been developed all our product uh, safety uh, uh, by design, but also privacy by design is the work that we need to do uh, uh, 
in, at the same time. Uh, and it's, it's, it's doable. I mean, we can do it. It's just um, a question of uh, priority and, uh, and also a question of uh, at what moment you start to think about this, uh, this uh, uh, question of compliance with privacy that you need to, that you need to uh, take in consideration. Um, and for example, uh, one of the work that we've been doing is working with all the institution and administration in France, but also in UK, for example, to work on what obligation we need to, uh, to, to integrate. Um, and the work that we've been doing with the, the French standard uh, organization, we've created, uh, we, we created a working group. Uh, with this agency and we in this working group we had a lot of companies like Meta for example but also NGOs, uh, uh, child protection NGOs but also institutions uh, and agencies such as the French Data Protection Authority yeah. for example and we've come up with uh, 100 pages of operational solution uh, giving uh, 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 guidelines and recommendations on how to protect minors online, how to protect minors on social media, uh, how to moderate content, how to uh, work on age assurance, because there's a lot of solutions today that we can use. Uh, you've come here to talk to lawmakers, to show off this document and to see whether or not it will be adopted. Do you, has it landed on, on ears that are welcoming? Are these sorts of 100 pages that you've given going to work in the United States as well as in, in Europe and the UK? We hope so. We hope so. That's the, that's the purpose. That there's no reason why it shouldn't work because uh, we, have all the, we face all the same issues in terms of risk, but we also now kind of um, ending at a point where the legislation uh, in terms of privacy, but also of uh, child protection and uh, uh, social media legislation, um, it's kind of not the same everywhere, but we are heading all uh, at the, in the same direction. Um, so there's no, there's no, uh, no reason why it shouldn't work here. Um, as I said, Meta was part of this working group, for example, and, uh, and, uh, and we had uh, no difficulty um, ending up uh, on something that we are all agreed on. And that's, yeah. that's the way we should, that's the thing we should keep in mind today. Multi-stakeholder uh, work is the way we, we will achieve uh, this purpose and yeah. we will achieve uh, um, and having a social platform that protects children uh, and that, come, that are safe for them. Yeah. Uh, that's really the goal that we all want to achieve and, and that's, uh, yeah. So. Sharon Franco, thank you for talking us through this document. And of course, many can go out there and see it, what you've made at UBO, the head of legal and public policy there. Meanwhile, coming up, We'll take a deep dive into healthcare investing and more. That's with Obvious Ventures. Stick with us for VC Spotlight. This is Bloomberg Technology. Let's talk about investing from a venture perspective, particularly in health tech right now. VC Spotlight is upon us. Obvious Ventures co-founder and managing director, Vishal Vasish is with us. Obvious, over $1 billion in assets under management. And well, how much you've been able to put to work as you kick off the new year? How much are you seeing opportunities to write new checks at the moment, Vishal? First of all, uh, thanks very much for inviting me here, Ed and Caroline. Uh, great, great to be here. Um, at Obvious, we've been uh, busy. Uh, as you uh, said, we have uh, over $1 billion uh, under management. Um, we uh, believe at Obvious uh, that the most valuable companies of our times would be companies which are solving humanity's biggest challenges. We believe uh, that um, if we focus with this intentionality around three broad areas, one is uh, planet health, human health, and economic health, uh, we'll create amazing companies for, for our times. And this kind of investing is what we call world positive investing. What I find so interesting about this area, Vishal, is if you take health as an example, be it a piece of software or even in the hardware space, in North America, you're trying to build a product and a company that's selling into a highly regulated sector. And you're doing business with private and public orgs that have to go through tender processes that move really slow. And I wonder how difficult that makes life for you when you're trying to write an early check to a company whose future you're assessing? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, all of us can agree that uh, we believe uh, that, uh, that 
we're not getting bang for our healthcare buck. There's a huge amount of opportunities in our healthcare system. We spend $4 trillion uh, in our healthcare system, but our outcomes are not that great as compared to other similar nations. We have an aging population, um, and this aging population is going to put more uh, pressure on our healthcare system as well as our healthcare workers who are wonderful frontline workers. Healthcare is a regulated industry. Things move slowly, uh, but it's good as new innovations come, like AI, uh, that because of regulation, we are able to be very thoughtful upfront to make a positive dent and solve these big problems in healthcare. Uh, Vishal, I'm in New York today, just hopped over from San Francisco, where I'm normally based. Caroline and I love to get the scoop, okay? We just had JP Morgan, where all of your industry peers were in the city all of the bankers, all of the VCs, all of the startup founders, and all of the bigger biotech companies. Is there any movement in the days that have followed, you know, any deals that have crossed your desk as a direct result of JP Morgan Healthcare Conference? Yeah, I know JP Morgan always brings all the industry players here in our wonderful city in San Francisco. Uh, I think the, the critical thing all of us are talking about is uh, what are the kind of big problems and what are the solutions? At Obvious, we focus on three broad areas uh, uh, in healthcare. One, we believe our healthcare payment system has to kind of move towards more outcome-driven versus paying for services only. And this, the industry calls this value-based um, approach of healthcare. Number two, we believe the infrastructure of healthcare right now is being powered from a technology point of view uh, for episodic care uh, and for billing. And we need to move towards more holistic care, more longitudinal care, and thanks to new technologies like generative AI, in future move towards more intelligent care so that, so that uh, we can provide excellent care for every human being on the planet. Yeah. And number three, uh, from a biology point of view, we believe biology is not very well understood. So computational approaches as a way to decode biology so that we can build amazing drugs at great prices, fast timelines, and in personalized ways. So all the industry people are thinking about that at JPM, uh, and we at Obvious have been investing in these three areas. How much are you thinking and how much are your founders thinking about a political change? Mm. and about potential for policy making to be different under potentially a different president come the end of this year? Yeah, again, I think all of us, whether we are Democrats or Republicans, we all agree that we are not getting bang for our health care buck. And because we are not getting a bang for our health care work, all of us need to kind of figure out how do we move towards kind of solutions and supporting solutions. We are investing in innovation economy. We are thinking about what would happen in the next 10 years. We don't think about kind of, you know, what is going to happen in the next quarter. And these problems are real, and there's potential for companies uh, to be built new, using new technologies like generative AI. Obvious Ventures co-founder and managing director Vishal Vashish Thank you so much for your time. Now, coming up here on Bloomberg Technology, Bitcoin tops $41,000 as ETF flows slow from the Grayskull Bitcoin Trust. Got those details next. This is Bloomberg Technology. It's time for Talking Tech. And first up, this is something I reported overnight with our deals team and Ian King. Chip startup Cerebras Systems is considering an initial public offering as soon as this year. Bloomberg sources say the AI supercomputer maker is aiming for the second half of the year. An IPO could value Cerebras above the $4 billion figure it achieved in its last round in 2021. And Microsoft is warning others about a Russian state-sponsored hacking group. Last week, Microsoft accused the group known as Mid 
midnight blizzard or cozy bear of hacking into its executives' emails in December 2023. Earlier this week, HPE reported a data breach that was likely caused by the same group. Plus, after securing $50 million in funding from investors, Trim has officially become India's first AI startup to gain a billion dollar valuation. Keep in mind, there's only been one month since it debuted its LLM. Caroline. Wow, things move fast. Meanwhile, so does the world of crypto. Let's just get a check in on where Bitcoin is, because actually it's above $41,000. It's well off the highs that we've seen in the month or so. But is there a slowdown in outflows from the all-important Grayscale Bitcoin Trust? Strategists seem to think that maybe if we can slow that outflow, maybe we'll see some resilience in the price of Bitcoin. Let's talk about the tokens. James Seifert's with us, Bloomberg Intelligence. And James, why should outflows of an ETF matter particularly to a price point? Yeah, I mean, so the outflows of an ETF, they are part of the entire pie that makes up the price of Bitcoin because you are dealing in spot Bitcoin at the end of the day. So outflows of the ETF are selling of Bitcoin. Um, that said, we've had net inflows since these things launched mm. on the spot Bitcoin ETFs in the US. You look at a little more broadly, though, you can see that open interest, so futures in the CME Bitcoin futures, that's down. Uh, you've had a little bit of outflows from Canadian ETFs. You've had a little bit of outflows from European Bitcoin ETFs. So net net, there has been net outflow. But what a lot of people seem to be missing is like, these are just a piece of the pie, right? This is not, there's a lot of other things going on here. These are a small percentage point in what's actually happening to uh, the Bitcoin price. I'm reading the Bloomberg terminal and there's this sort of narrative around rebounding back toward 4,200 US dollars per token. But if you just look at a chart, we kind of tumbled down from that January 8 high and we're having a sprightly uptick. Uh, explain that, that trading action relative to the actual mechanics of the products that have come online in the last three weeks. Yeah, so I mean, from my point of view, it's kind of been sideways since like January, right? So we, we had on the ETF launch, we had a massive spike up to 49. But for the most part, we've been in this low 40s range. It's dipped below 40 a little bit here and there. Um, but I think a lot of the selling, I mean, we knew this was going to happen. There was a lot of money that was tied up in GBTC, institutional capital, capital from bankruptcies like FTX. DCG has a lot of money tied up in here that they probably need access to themselves. They're the parent company of Grayscale's GBTC. Um, so there's been like forced selling in the market because people, they, they want to get their capital out. Um, but there has also been buying on the other side of this. So, um, th there was, there was undoubtedly forced selling that caused what we've seen in the, in recent weeks. I think people are expecting this to slow down. We've seen right. some of it hint hinted at this, like Caroline mentioned, we only saw 394 million come out of GBTC yesterday, which is, which is a low yeah. of, over the last couple of weeks. James, great to catch up with you. The never dials down when it comes to the world of the new ETS. We thank you from Bloomberg Intelligence. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Nice to have you here. Thank you. Check out the pod from New York City. And a little trip. There's the deets. This is Bloomberg.